but I don't know how hard it's blowing where you are, but it's blowing like the devil here. I'm on the Beaulieu River, that's my boat down there, in the snuggest place you could possibly have. She's tucked up right under the bank here, tied up for the winter. In the summer, or in the spring and the autumn when I'm not away, I'm down on a stream mooring further up there, but uh, right now I'm very, very glad to be where I am, <laughs> because last night I woke up at about three o'clock in the morning and there was such a gust of wind that it actually shook my brick house. I, I don't ever remember that before. Um, I'm up in the new forest, I'm surrounded by trees and I just couldn't believe how hard it was blowing, but that's, that's what actually happened. Um, last night at the Needles, it actually was blowing 80 knots, 80 knots, and it was blowing 90 at Pearl Point, which is uh, completely off the Beaufort scale. It was doing serious stuff indeed. I've been looking at one or two webcams this morning down in the West Country and the, the size of the seas that are coming in there is something to see. Anyway, here I am. People say that the berth I have here is expensive and I'm always reminded of the man I once met in a pub and we were drinking a pint of beer and some guy at the table was complaining, he said, well this is the most expensive pint I've had. And I said to him, yeah, but have you ever had a better pint? It's wonderful, it's the most beautiful pint of beer. And the chap next to me said, he said, the trouble with the likes of you, spoken to the other fella, he says, you know the price of everything and the value of nothing. And that's how it is here, quite honestly. Actually, the marina's no more expensive than anywhere else, but the, uh, the swinging moorings are a bit pricier than next door. But uh, my, my goodness me, we are totally sheltered, we're well spread out, we've got good facilities, no worries at all. And I'm more than happy to pay for that, because the yachting costs enough anyway, doesn't it? An extra few quid on the bottom of the sum of human misery isn't the end of the world, but I want to enjoy it. And I really do, because I'm safe. It's a great thing to know your boats somewhere where the wind and the waves can't get at her. Well, I've just got back from the boat and it is blowing stink down there, but I've checked my lines, freshened up all the nips, made sure there's no chafe, run my engines just to sort them out and, uh, well, I've left her to it. There's nothing else I can do and she'll be fine. So I can stop worrying about that. But as I was driving home, and the car was blown about as I came over the New Forest. I fell to thinking about the Beaufort scale and what it really means, because I think I mentioned down there that it had been blowing 80 knots or something down the channel. And um, it's right off the Beaufort scale, isn't it? I mean, force 12 is 60 knots. And um, <clears throat> we think in terms of knots. <clears throat> but when <clears throat> Admiral Beaufort set up the scale in the early 19th century, he didn't have an anemometer. He knew how many knots his ship was making because he hove a thing over the side and counted the knots running out over the taffrail. But he didn't think in those terms at all when it came to wind and neither did anybody else. What they wanted to know was what sail they could carry. And that's a lot more interesting really. And Admiral Beaufort um, set up his force one, two, three, four, five, etc. in terms of when you had to reef your sails in a man of war. Well, there you go. Actually, when I was a young chap, and we had no anemometers on our boats. We used to do the same, really. We'd look over the side and we could make an assessment by looking at the sea state. It was blowing force four. The little tops of the waves would just be popping off. Force five, you'd start to get little streaks. In force six, you had proper streaks of foam blowing down the waves. Force seven, it blew you out off. Force eight, you didn't want to be there. And force nine, you really, really knew it was serious. At force 10, and this is how my wife calculates really strong winds because she remembers some big gales in the old days. And um, she always says to me, well, it's easy, you know, when it's blowing force 10 because you can't stand up on deck anymore. And that's about the size of it, actually. And 50 knots, I hear people rattling on all the time. Oh, it's blowing 50 knots across the deck. Oh, really? Yeah, well, maybe the little dial said so. But if you could stand up out there, it wasn't. You have to crawl along the deck when it's blowing that windy. I've got here, I looked it up very quickly downstairs before I came up. I've got Admiral Beaufort's original, original, um, original Beaufort scale. And it's, uh, it's very interesting um, because this is for men of war in 1831. And he doesn't say much about things until it's blowing the top end of force four. Uh, he just says that in which a man of war with all sails set and clean full, that is probably, probably a beam reach or maybe slightly broader beam, would go in smooth water. And force five, he's getting a bit sniffy about it. Uh, and he says, um, Force 5, you can carry your royals, probably, but maybe you're going to take them in. In Force 6, 
single reef topsails and t'gallant sails. Those great big topsails they had, great big deep sails above the bottom sail, the course. They had rows and rows of reef points and they were really the driving sail of the vessel. So they'd be starting to reef them, but they were still carrying t'gallants above them. And then in Force 7, which he describes as a moderate gale, they were down to double reef topsails and jib and a couple of, couple of headsails probably. In Force 8, a fresh gale, treble reef topsails, Force 9, strong gale. Well, it's getting serious now, isn't it? Uh, and he's on close reef topsails and courses. That's these topsails, these mighty sails, are reefed to the absolute minimum. And he's still got his big bottom sails on in Force 9. And he describes this now as full and by. That is, he's just off close hauled, which in the sort of sea that would be running in Force 9 would be the best he would manage to make to windward. Probably 75 degrees off by then and just about holding his own. But that's the amount of sail a, a, a sizeable man of war would be able to carry. <clears throat> At Force 10, which he describes as a whole gale, it's that in which he could scarcely bear close reef main topsail and reefed foresail. And after Force 11, he's sort of that which would reduce it to storm sails. Force 12, which he describes as a hurricane, is that which no canvas could withstand. So there you are. Well, race boats are tearing down wind in 60 knots these days, aren't they, with 25 knots, bringing the apparent speed down to 35 knots. But, I mean, the likes of most of us can't do that. And I can personally testify to the fact that when you were sailing with cotton canvas and flax canvas, in force 10 and a half, it couldn't stand any longer. And you couldn't stand either because you were blown over on the deck. So that was it. But it's a long time since I've faced that sort of weather. These days, um, I'm sailing around Europe. I've watched the wonderful forecast that we've got today. I could even watch my little anemometer, which is sort of reassuring, but doesn't tell me anything I don't know, really. Because um, for those of us who go cruising, we know when to reef, don't we? We reef when the helm starts to get unbalanced, when the boat's leaning over so you can't make a decent cup of tea. And we also know, tragically and to our consequence, that when we're going to windward, you can't reef her down too much because the only way you can get a boat to windward is to drive her. We don't like it. It's grown your may, but go you must.